What is up, plant people? It's Tuesday again, and that means it's time for the Planthropology Podcast, the show where we dive into the lives, careers, and general awesomeness of some very cool plant people. I'm Vikram Baliga, your host, and as always, I'm just thrilled to be with you today. So if my voice sounds a little bit weird and deep and alluring more than usual, it's because I'm trying to get over a head cold, and so everything sounds weird coming out of my mouth and coming into my ears. So I really no idea what I sound like, but it's okay. Um, but we soldier on, right? We keep going. And I am so excited that we do because this episode, I think you're going to love. So I get to talk with an old friend of mine, Dr. Austin Moore, who was a colleague and fellow grad student here at Texas Tech University um, before he went off to do great things. He is an assistant professor of ag communications and uh, a good man, just a good man. That's ultimately being a good human is about the best compliment I think I know how to give to anyone. And Austin is a grade A, genuine, 100% good human. So we talked about everything from communications and communication styles and what we need to remember when we talk to the public and the unique challenges in agriculture and what it's like to start and build a new program. I can't even imagine. But Austin is fascinating and warm and brilliant, and I know you're really going to enjoy this. So before we get started, I hope that you are having a wonderful November so far. And today, as you hear this on Tuesday, November 2nd, it is the second anniversary of Planthropology. That's right. It's the show's second birthday. And on Twitter, y'all voted that you wanted me to uh, make some reaction videos to some of these, oh, what's a good word? Bonkers? Silly? Out of control plant hack videos that are out there on the interwebs. So I'm going to do that over the next few weeks. I'll spend the month of November. Hopefully I'll put three or four of these out. But if you've got favorite videos that you would like me to react to, please send them my way and I would love to do the thing. Uh, make sure you're following Planthropology on all the places. We'll talk more at the mid-roll. And y'all, I'm glad it's fall. Here where I live in West Texas, in the southern high plains of the United States, fall finally showed up as you're listening to this. If you're listening to this on the day it drops, it's about 40 degrees Fahrenheit and rainy and cloudy, and it feels like fall finally. So I hope wherever you are, the weather is lovely. I hope you're having a good day. And I hope you're ready for a wonderful episode of Planthropology with my friend, Dr. Austin Moore. All right. Well, we're uh, back with Planthropology. Austin, how are you doing today? I'm having a really nice day. It's uh, It's been a, a pleasant, lovely bit of weather, a little bit of rain this morning, but uh, here in South Georgia, rain is just such an uneventful thing. It just sort of, <laughs> you get a little wet for a minute, and then it stops, and uh, it's sunny again. You usually see the sun while it's raining. It's it's so unusual from that's what I'm used weird. to in West Texas. Yeah, that's super weird. I mean, you were in Lubbock for a while, and, and we'll talk about this more as we get into it. And you're, you know, from Oklahoma, and, mm -hmm. and like, if so Georgia must be a bit of an adjustment. It is. It's, I, I've been trying to explain this to folks back home, and it, it just feels more alive than what I'm used to. I mean, that's not to say that things were <laughs> dead, dead and barren in, in Lubbock or, I mean, or even in Oklahoma, but I mean, here there's just life. Like you have to fight it off. You know, we tend to fight the ground to get something to grow out of it a lot and where I'm used to growing up and all. Uh, out here, you're fighting it back all the time uh, just to not overtake you. But no, it's, it's good. We got lots of bugs, lots of plants. It's exciting. That's awesome. So Austin, why don't you uh, uh, tell us more about yourself? And by the way, I'm excited we get to do this. Uh, you know, for those of you that that don't know, and uh, which is probably most of you, I guess, I don't know why you would know this. Uh, but Austin and I were friends at Tech, uh, and he has gotten a really cool position in Georgia and moved on. But I'm, I'm excited to get to as much as as much as anything else. This is just a thinly veiled excuse to talk to my friends. <laughs> And that's uh, the best work. That's the best type of work always. So. Yeah. So yeah, tell us tell us more about yourself. Where'd you grow up? How'd you get to where you are today? Sure. Well, I grew up uh, all around the Oklahoma and Texas Panhandles, Western Oklahoma. Uh, my dad was a essentially a hired hand for different agricultural uh, outfits. He'd worked for a uh, paymaster for a while on, on seed farms and whatnot, and then 
ran a couple of different uh, ranching uh, operations, and uh, graduated from a, a high school in a small town in uh, western Oklahoma called Cheyenne. Uh, went to Oklahoma State, didn't know what I was going to do, and a, and a good uh, mutual friend of ours, who I was a friend with in 4-H, said, well, you like to talk a lot. Why don't you uh, come be an ag com? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the rest is history. I mean, just it worked out well. I, I kind of found my passion with television while I was there uh, doing a daily show that we did. Uh, went on and did some work uh, for Extension in Texas, doing educational and marketing videos for Extension. Uh, went back to Oklahoma after a, after a decade of what I called foreign service, living in Texas at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, did a, a daily, uh, pardon me, a weekly television show for Oklahoma Extension for about the next six years, a show called Sun Up, which still runs. And I'm still very proud of that one. And uh, then we went on and I did a, a show called Oklahoma Horizon, which uh, was done by Career Tech in Oklahoma. A little broader in, in aspect, Sun Up was a professional development for farmers and ranchers show. Uh, we were there to help them be better at their job. And uh, with Horizon, we talked about work of all sorts, including agriculture and and all of the things associated, but even more broadly with that show, I got to go into prisons. I got to go into high rises. I got to go into a lot of mom and pop shops and just talk to people about work. And uh, uh, yeah, I did that for a while before going back to get the, uh, get the PhD. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're a crazy person like I am yeah. and you decided to go back for more. <laughs> I did. Uh, I did 20 years in the field. And then I, let's, let's just wow. quit it, quit the job, sell the house and let's go to school. Wow. So, yeah. so I want to, I want to talk about that for a second. Cause we do talk quite a bit on the show about academia and mm-hmm. <laughs> how, Oh, I don't, I don't, I don't want to use the word that I, I can't, I cannot use the word I want to use, uh, for, to describe this thing that we do. <laughs> um, but you know, so I was in industry for just a couple of years before I came back for my PhD, mm-hmm. maybe, you know, two years in industry and then a couple of years with extension before I started, uh, uh back from my PhD. So after, I mean, essentially a career, mm-hmm. like, like a full career going back to school. What was that like? You know, it was it was exciting. Um, we talk a lot when you go to grad school. There's a lot of talk always between, you know, should someone go straight into grad school? Should they go work in industry? How long and whatnot? Um, I, and I, I do honestly believe there's not a good answer to that. I think it's mm-hmm. the answer that's right for you. So I've had students I've counseled to go straight from undergrad to get their master's. Those master's students we've talked about going to industry or going back. For me, coming back after that time meant that all the things I had thought about and argued with and, and just been in, in the, the throes of the career, um, what are we doing with this audience? How do we craft this message? What's going to be impactful? Suddenly, we were in classes talking about the actual theories that have been developed, or at least in an industry I had no idea about. So huh. there was a context for me that came from that experience that I really appreciated. Um, I don't think that 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 you have to have that to appreciate the experience and grow from it. But for me, that was a big part of it. That's really, that's, that's really a good comment because I think, you know, so, so much of our challenge as educators, you know, you're, you're an educator. I I am too, Mm -hmm. is, is contextualizing the information we give that, that is in my opinion, the hardest part of the job. Absolutely. Because I can, I can pull up a PowerPoint or open a book and be like, Hey, here's some facts. Here's, this and that and this theory and this biological problem, whatever. But, but contextualizing it in a way that actually means something to a, a, a human, I'm, you know, I'm thinking in my head, the 18 to 20 year olds that I typically teach is, yeah. is really a challenge. So it's, it's interesting, like hearing you say that, that, you know, you got the context first, right, <laughs> sort of, and then came back and applied the theory and, to and it. It made sense to me at that point. You know, the, I always, I tell people that, and, and part of that is just, Growing up in the, the 80s and 90s, my view of college was shaped entirely by television and sitcoms, right? A uh, Different World was a big show for me. I, I always wanted to be Dwayne Wayne, uh, which I was opposite <laughs> of that as can be, but I, I'm not even that good at math like he was. But, you know, you, that's what I thought college was. And so what grad school was, was what I expected my undergraduate experience to be. The debates on theory and the, and the really digging into this stuff. That's what I thought you would do in college. And at least in our field, in ag communications, as an undergrad, you're very applied. You're coming in, we're teaching you the skills of our trade. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's not that I didn't greatly appreciate my undergraduate degree, but it was really cool to finally get to work on master's and doctoral level stuff and and do the things I've been wanting to do for 20 years. Um, It was fun. Now, I will point out, though, this is, as you talk about that context, this is a place where I think I can point to one of the great failings of our field. I was a, a communicator working on a college campus. 
I was doing the job of science communication for extension for 16 years. Yeah. And I didn't know the theoretical work was out there. I assumed somebody was doing it. I dealt with other people's science in other parts of agriculture. I'd never seen ours. And so I still think this is one of the, where agcom is a great and growing field. I think the biggest challenge we have is to somehow take the information that we're developing in research and truly communicate it and deliver it to those who are doing the job out in the field. I think we're not doing anywhere near the, the job we should do there. You know, and that's, that's so interesting. You know, when I, I talked, oh gosh, we're coming up on two years of planthropology, which blows my mind. But over a year ago, I talked to um, uh, Dr. Earl Beck, Erica, mm-hmm. and then uh, now Dr. Opat. Yes, uh, Kelsey, and um, who was almost Dr. Opat at that time. <laughs> uh, and they had some similar thoughts, I think, where, yeah. you know, it was like, we have to figure out how to, uh, you know, we, we live in, in academia in this like cult of quantification in some ways where it's like you have yeah. to be able to put data to everything. And sometimes that is pretty onerous, I think. Uh, and and yeah. sometimes it feels... I don't know what the right word is. It feels like just a, a burden, but on the, on the backside of that, there is a lot of importance to that. It's so yes. important that we put facts and figures and, and numbers and uh, a, a theoretical framework to the things that we do. Well, in the, in the research side, we do a great deal of, I, I do agree. It's very important work of finding out not only the, the what is going on in the world, but why it's happening. And, and as we put all that together, the, that part, I think we do very well in research. It's that question of then taking it to people who've already been through college and are now working. How do we get that information back to them? And that's that's where we have to keep exploring. Um, particularly in our field, it's fun because while we can talk about this heavy science and the way we, we communicate and all these wonderful systems, we're doing it through podcasting. We're doing it through mm-hmm. social media. And so we really are this weird kind of lovely edge of really hardcore science of thought and belief and understanding at the same time, changing, evolving communications technology. And I think all that comes together to be some, it's a fun place to play. Yeah. So it's a good sandbox. Well, and you and I have talked a little bit about, you know, how do we do some work together? I'm, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, I'm a very much an amateur at the science communication thing and this, this, you know, out, I mean, I, I had, I say that, let me take that back. I, yeah, I have do. spent a lot of time as a, um, communications and mm-hmm. a public education professional. I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be that way. But the fact is that like, this is almost tangent to, to a lot of the other things that I do, the communication yeah. side. And we've talked about, you know, how do we work together to maybe uh, take some of the science work that I do as well as the communication with the communication work that you do and come up with some cool research. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that developing. Agreed. Agreed. Absolutely. Well, the, the fun part about it and, and to give yourself a little bit of a break here, if you look at the field of science communication and you march off the tens of football field and you marched over to the sidelines and you mark, this is the edge of the field and plant your flag that I'm going to be great at this little edge, this cutting edge place in about six months, it'll be old hat. Uh, We are expanding and growing. The tech is changing. The field is shifting underneath us. So I think we all feel like we're paying catch up at some point uh, in, in this field. i like I'm playing with a new recorder here on my end. I'm having, uh, I just to keep up with the technology to introduce my students uh, is is a lot of fun. Oh, for sure. And and I I uh, I'm trying to introduce some of that into my intro horticulture class. I normally I can't remember if we talked about this uh, last time we spoke, but uh, I normally have them write a paper at the end of the semester to kind mm-hmm. of wrap up. Oh, you know, what did you actually learn? Because you know, I, I think it is not a secret that a multiple choice exam is not the best way to evaluate that information. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. it's the thing we do, right? Yeah. Uh, and I have 154 students, and so I don't want to grade a thousand essays all yeah. semester. Um, so I normally have them write a paper, but this year I'm expanding it a little bit, and I'm letting them either do a five minute, five to ten minute podcast episode, a five mm-hmm. to ten minute like vlog style YouTube video, or a three minute TikTok uh, go like talking about whatever subject they choose. And I I think it's important, like what you're talking about, that we start that process of here's the, the technology and here are the avenues we use to talk about science. I mean, most of my students are freshmen and I think regardless of their majors, whatever I've not majors, it's important that we teach them how to effectively communicate. Absolutely. 
five, six years from now, those freshmen will be the cutting edge people in the office who are asked to do whatever the new TikTok is, the thing that's just shown up. And so the, the key to me, and that's where I think a lot of that theoretical part plays into college, and we need to continue communicating that to those in industry, but it's those pieces stay the same. So I understand how people, or we understand how people process information, the different things that, that affect that information processing. That will be the same regardless of whether we're looking at uh, an Instagram, a TikTok, an in-person presentation, how well you build a PowerPoint. All of those base considerations stay the same. It's just the the tools, the methods, the pathways will evolve for us. And so, yeah, we do continue uh, playing with it. I, look, I'm, I'm the guy, I, I, got in, I stayed in this career. I was interested in it in the first place. I found that my happy place is wandering around a, a field, preferably row crops, because they're, <laughs> they're so consistent. It's a challenge to get in there and take pretty pictures and, hmm. and to do, do noon pictures, right? So if I go out and I shoot wheat and then I go back in two weeks and I shoot wheat and I go to another field and I shoot wheat, how do I not make it all look like the same thing, right? <laughs> I love that challenge. I'm that nerd. <laughs> but technology, the camera I carry out there changes and they do different things. And, you know, when I started out, I had really expensive cameras that had, by comparison to the phone I carry in my pocket now, ridiculously low uh, a resolution. Right. They didn't do slow motion. They didn't do any of the things, you know, and I, I'm sitting here today working with, uh, this morning I was talking to another scientist who has a challenge. Uh, I don't want to get too much into revealing her research, but we're trying to figure out how we can use lenses to measure distance and setting up multiple cameras and figuring up the math on it. And it's, you know, we have so many technological options now that really open the stuff up if we don't understand how to use them and we use them intentionally, I think we can do some really interesting things. Uh, maybe make a big impact on the world one day or another. Well, that, that is the goal, I think. I mean, I think I we, so. we, sh we should be striving for that, right? I mean, <laughs> right, I agree. Uh, but no, it, that, but it is, that is a big task, and I think it's a big uh, yeah. undertaking in the sciences of, you know, uh, basic science is great, and I think it is a thing that we need done, but that's, I'm, I'm very much like you, an applied scientist, and I, I get excited when I start to look at, okay, how, how can we do research that actually directly impacts the people we're talking to, yeah. it, it, you know, the stakeholders, the whatever, and maybe that's the extension in me, I don't know, but uh, I, I just think that that's, again, that's what gets me excited. And I'm glad there are people that are smarter than me and detail or more detail oriented than me to do the basic research that takes the, the hyper focus that I don't have, but I like the big picture of, of science. Oh yeah. I, I love what, there's a new article about physics out. I'm the first one to go read it and pretend that I understood what they said. <laughs> I, I jump on that in a heartbeat, but look, this last year, I, I think we'd all agree has been the last year, year and a half pretty challenging for all of us in, in different different levels of, of actual challenging in work, challenging emotionally, and so on. Uh, the one thing that's kind of kept me going is I've recognized that we're living in a giant laboratory right now for what I do, for, hmm. for science communications, uh, whether you're talking pandemic or on down the list, um, talking about persuasion, talking about uh, how we just convince people uh, to evaluate risk. Uh, there's a, so much to be considered at a truly global scale right now, uh, I'm hoping that's kind of the, the silver lining that comes out of a fairly rough period of time in our, our recent history is that we do learn better of how to reach people or change the minds. We've known for a long time that, look, I, we can look at this thing, we call it the knowledge gap, where uh, we always sort of assume if they just knew what I knew, if I could mm -hmm. just show people what they don't know, they would agree with me. Uh, we've known for a long time that that doesn't always work. In fact, I, I would argue it probably doesn't often work. We can change people's knowledge. That doesn't mean we've changed their opinion of what should be done, policy, personal motivation, whatever you want to look at. Motivation is a very different thing than understanding. And I think we've had a, such a great illustration of that over the past year. Um, I hope we can continue to grow from it. For sure. So I want to I want to pivot just a little bit yeah, yeah. or 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 get maybe maybe not pivot's not the right word. I think I want to dr drill this down a little more specifically to uh your field of ag communication mm -hmm. because I think as as a well they're not different. They're not independent. I think in some of the struggles we see in uh you know everything from um vaccine acceptance to you know public health measures and all of that is a microcosm of what we we see sure. across the field. Absolutely. But but I, I think the field of ag and ag communication is so different in some ways to wide scale uh uh 
you know, science communication or because maybe of the demographics we deal with, maybe because mm-hmm. of some of the um, specific concerns of the agricultural yeah. population. Can you give us just an overview of, and this may sound like a super basic question, but like, what is ag communication? What does that mean? You know, it's funny. I actually got that question earlier today. I stopped, uh, I went to pick up my wife for lunch and our lawn guy was there and we got to talking and he asked, so what is ag com? What do you do there? <laughs> so I had practice today. Uh, so ag communication <laughs> is, is essentially the, the, the practice of, of communication sciences, uh, just as, as we would talk about in any other field, but very focused on the agricultural industry. So we have two primary uh, modes. One is external communication. That is to uh, shape and craft messages about what we do in agriculture to the public. So that uh, consumers of our products, particularly when you think about food and fiber, how do we communicate what the food and fiber we're doing will do for the com- consumer? And hopefully uh, affect some behaviors there, not just from a purchasing standpoint, but uh, when we think about stuff like the food pyramid that we used to talk about, that's an ad column job, telling people about their food, how to be more nutritious, more healthy. Uh, we definitely take a broad view of what agriculture is within agcom. Right. Obviously, we talk about the field and the pasture, uh, but we talk more broadly. I mean, transportation systems are part of agriculture as, as we need to be involved in the, the marketing of, of food. A lot of research has been done in the last few years on just food labeling and what does that do with consumers and consumer perceptions, uh, both in nutrition labeling, but also front of package labeling and just getting people's attention in the store. Uh, then the other side of it, and where I've spent most of my work, is in the communication of uh, uh, information within agriculture. So producer or groups to producers, extension, obviously, talking to producers, talking to legislators and letting them know. Uh, one of my biggest jobs for uh, the time I was in Texas was uh, I was working for extension at a time when our legislature became urban, when mm. really suddenly eight counties within the state of Texas uh, dominated the, the 250 uh, four or six, I always forget because we didn't have offices everywhere. Uh, but, you know, this massive number, eight counties decide what happens in the legislature, and those eight counties don't think of themselves as agriculturalists necessarily. Yeah. Uh, but we did stuff there, and we had very active things. And so part of my job was to help explain the work we were doing as extension to those legislators and help them understand what was happening in their very busy counties. Um, so from a from a, that standpoint, um you can think of ag communications as, as ag journalism, both internally and externally. So new product coming out, new practice been developed, let's tell producers. Uh, new product going to the market, let's tell consumers about it. Uh, but we also do a lot of, of marketing. There's, I was primarily a brand journalist within my career, which is to say we follow journalistic uh, styles and activities, but we did those for a brand. We were not by any means okay. true journalists. So okay. uh, we're it, extension being a perfect example. I'm telling those stories. I'm following a journalistic ethic. I'm using that same style, but I wasn't out looking for, you know, I'm not doing sports stories. I'm not looking for what's just going to grab ratings. I'm telling the stories of the brand I work for. Gotcha. Okay. So, you know, yeah, news, marketing, journalism, uh, graphic design. Uh, graphic design is, is always uh, of, of interest within our field uh, just because, again, what are people using? And then, of course, social media is, of course, the biggest thing of how that's being used to communicate about ag, but also what are our agricultural and rural populations using? Because we get so segmented. I mean, you can say, let's do this for Facebook, but at the end of the day, what channel is really seeing that within Facebook? There's not a a broadcast. When I put something on TV, I'm getting a whole lot of households. If I put something on TikTok, TikTok's algorithm decides who sees it. And that algorithm is crazy. It's wild. So it's <laughs> impressive, uh, but also a little scary. Yep. <laughs> so yep. Uh, that's yeah, kind of a, a broad swath of what AgCom is. But um, I tell you what, you got a grant, I'll define it more broadly. Don't just fit however I can. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. If you're out there listening and you're like, you know what, I would love to write a grant in, <laughs> yes. in AgCom and and include Doctor Moore on it. Absolutely. Uh, please, hit please. Us. Yeah. So, hit us up. That's uh, an academic right there that's an academic talk Uh, oh yeah no you can't help it um (laughs) so i I would uh, what are some of the and i don't know i'm trying to figure out the best way to ask this question because it's broad and not broad and i don't want you to uh step into the line of fire anywhere what are some of the um what are some of the main challenges you see in ag communication Mm. in terms of what you do especially internally sure uh, as we talk to agriculturists what where does our focus, do you think, personally need to be? 
You know, I think part of our challenge right now, and I've been reflecting on this a bit lately, is in not classifying ourselves into a lane. Hmm. So when you're working either for, uh, look, a lot of our, our graduates in AgCom go on to work, uh, some for organizations like Extension, others for more general ag organizations, say Farm Bureau and so on, others sure. for commodity groups. But we have folks go on to sales, go on to law school. I mean, we go, we go all over the place. Um, but if you think about those, it's very easy to get in a certain lane and to think of agriculture um, more as a monolith than it is. So mm. if you're working in big production, if you're – frankly, uh, if we're out in western Oklahoma, we think a lot about cattle and wheat, and we think that's what agriculture is. Uh, I always loved growing up in these communities where when somebody would mention being a vegetarian, it would be they'd be treated as anti-agriculture. <laughs> and I'm still sitting there going, what are they eating? It's agriculture. It's, yeah. it's yeah. not what we're doing with cattle necessarily. But That's a really good um, point. You know, we are, we treat ag as looking the way that what we're used to seeing. And so, uh, for instance, if you're, if you're, um, if you're in a type of production where um, you're doing one type of crop you, and very intensive growth, uh, you may be dealing with a lot more herbicides and, and so on. And maybe you need some machinery that's very expensive to do your job. There are other people out there who are served in other ways who are doing a smaller operation they're not looking to go buy that combine at 1.2 million, you know, <laughs> that's just not going to work right. for them. So I think the challenge is, is being a, a good ad communicator is being able to serve multiple audiences and to recognize and kind of be that barometer that we can't just portray ag as one thing because then we're leaving out 99% of the rest of the industry uh, when we just get this one set focused view. Um, and it's, it's easy to do because we do all play in certain sandboxes. And look, if you're, if I'm working for the Texas pork, then I'm definitely focused on what's going on, the issues with pork. Uh, but there is a broader industry to think about, and there are other segments to think about. Um, where I think is the most interesting thing, though, for AgCom right now is that leadership role. And I, I see my colleagues, the people I went to my undergrad with, I see the students leaving uh, Texas Tech's uh, master's program really stepping into roles that are beyond leadership for communications and more into organizational leadership. Uh, okay. more and more. And so I really think people are recognizing that role of communications and the need for that in those leadership roles within those service organizations. And so then how can we better prepare them to be beyond a good communicator, a good leader and a good listener and, and someone who's very aware of policy. Uh, it's more and more important all the time that we have people who are able to advocate and, and talk sensibly about policy. Um, gosh, you know, it, it's funny. I mean, the communication part is almost the easy part of what we do. It's just the rest <laughs> of it uh, just seems to be of increasing importance. And I, I think it's just because we recruit really good people. Uh, we, we do. We tend to have great students uh, that come out of these programs and you give them responsibility. I mean, look, we get farm kids who like to talk. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. You know? um, yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, and when we talk about being able to contextualize information mm – -hmm that firsthand experience is so important. It is. And, and it is. it's so important that we continue to reach out to, you know, you made an interesting point earlier when you were talking about the urbanization of the state of Texas. And then let's yeah. just use that as an example. I was going to say a small example. Texas is not that, <laughs> but you know what I mean? I do. Uh, I do. Yeah. You know, we tend to start to, so we have conversations within the university. Okay. How do we recruit from this place or this place? Or, you know, we're not, we're not reaching this city because Texas A&M or we're not reaching this city because university of Texas or whatever. And, and because of that, we, I think even in a field like ours in, in the plant and soil science field mm -hmm. up here in agricultural, largely rural America, we start to turn our gaze away from the small town. We start to yeah. focus on these big population centers, and maybe that's natural, but gosh, the power of, like you said, a farm kid who, you know, has been driving a tractor since he was 14 years old and, mm -hmm. you know, feeding pigs at 6 a.m. before school and all this stuff, like... Somebody who knows how to work. Yeah, but but they're, the story that they could tell to the general public yes, about absolutely. what we do is so powerful. Right. But at the same time, and that's where we have this this kind of balance of challenge of do we draw on this resource that is, look, at the end of the day, there's always a money game. And for universities in sure. particular, we need students to enroll. That's part mm -hmm. of the, the job. But when we can pull from these smaller places and serve them well, and, and I'll give a little plug for the school here. Part of the reason I chose this school 
Uh, Abraham Baldwin Agricultural College. We're a small school of about, uh, pardon me, the college itself is about 3,000, 3 to 4,000 students. Uh, within our School of Agriculture, we've got the bulk of those. We're the biggest one. Uh, but our kids come from, from small places and they come here. Uh, they know they can get a really good education. They don't have to pay nearly as much as going to a major school. A lot of them are rural and they want to stay in a more rural community. And uh, Tifton here is a beautiful town, but it's only about 30,000 in the whole county. Uh, wow. We're, you know, a couple of blocks of Lubbock. Um, it's, it, the, there's a reason we kids come here. At the same time, we have to make sure that those kids who have those great things, who develop that work ethic, who have personal stories of the people, a, a genuine connection to industry, we need to make sure that we get them an experience that broadens their horizon. Uh, sure. Because oh, I, yeah. I think we've unfortunately politicized the idea of diversity out there, but diversity of experience, diversity of, look, we understand the importance of diversifying crops, what that can do to benefit our crops and our land. Right. It's the same thing with our minds. The more that we see and experience, the better we as, as someone to communicate, I can go out there and better contextualize what I've seen in that small town in a better concept of a world. Uh, there's oftentimes you run into that kid who's really well-intentioned from a small town, but their worldview is so small that when they try to explain something to someone with a different worldview, they can't make that connection. They can't contextualize it in a way that matters to the person from a, a major city. So a kid from out here at Tifton who's talking to someone who's never left Atlanta, do they have enough shared experience to right. be able to communicate? And so getting those experiences, taking them internationally, taking them across the U.S., seeing production agriculture in ways they have it before, boy, that really matters. For sure. Oh, man, we filter we filter our communication through the lens of our experience. Yes. And, yes. Well and, and And it makes it so hard when – you've got different glasses on, you know, like when you're, when your lenses are not the same. And I know, I, I think that is very important. How do we, how do we broaden worldviews? How do we, uh, and I think what we're doing now, you know, specifically on this show, no, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. this show will change the world. This is the one, this is, the this one. is it. This is yeah. it. So, you know, get out there, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for my Spotify deal. Um, <laughs> I'm not nearly controversial enough. Uh, <laughs> But but no, but I think that this type of communication, um, this this thing that makes so many people accessible to anyone, right. uh, and vice right. versa, is is yeah. incredibly powerful. Because then, uh, unlike say a hundred years ago, when the only way to expand your worldview was to travel to somewhere else, I mean, gosh, we've got so much here on our phones and on our, in our uh, podcast players and all that. And I think that, you know, like you were talking about as we expand technologies and there's always something new, uh, we can't be scared of that as science communicators. We should be embracing that. We can. And I'll, I'll throw out that the, the other challenge that I think we have to face as, as educators more broadly is to recognize the power of the information consumer right now, because on that phone, you have so many channels, so many opportunities. If you like a podcast with two guys talking to each other, hey, this may fit for you. If you prefer to hear one voice talking or something more highly produced, there's other options that will, will capture you. If all you care about is, is learning about true crime, there's people who will cater to that all day. There's a point of, of, of like almost like civics of information consumption that needs to be taught of saying, look, there's plenty of people who will fill your wants all day. But mm -hmm. you need to recognize a, as a consumer some of your needs, some of your, your informational needs, and, and then be able to take while well, you're given control to manage that control, to expose yourself uh, to good quality content, I mean, at least to turn on the weather once in a while and see if it's going to be raining in your town at the very least. Uh, I'd like to say all of our students should be required to listen to a certain amount of 80s music so they get my jokes in class. <laughs> but that is not truly a requirement for them. It would just be helpful. Oh, that would make life so much better. Like I, I made a I made a Tommy Boy reference one time and <laughs> blank stares, man. I I was like, Am I that old? And I guess I am now. I'm I getting was, there. I was quite proud. My first Friday of class this semester, uh, my opening slide, I always have a picture on the opening slide. I had a picture of the cure. And mm -hmm. boy, you talk about crickets in the room, and finally one girl goes, Is that the cure? And That's I amazing. Said, yes, it is. She I said, So why would I put those up there? And she couldn't get to Friday. I'm in love. She couldn't get there, uh, <laughs> but it's a step. It's a step. It's a link. Step. It's a link We're in that working chain. on them slowly. We'll get them where we need to get. 
Let's take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about what it's like to develop a brand new program at a university. Well, hey there. Welcome to the mid-roll. It's always great to see you here. So, I hope you're enjoying today's episode. I know I have been. I'm listening right along with you. All thousand, fifteen hundred times it happens. Don't worry about it. I don't have a life. It's okay. Anyway, so as usual, I would like to encourage you to follow Planthropology and connect all the places. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. If you look up Planthropology, which is anthropology with a PL slapped on the front, you see the green background with the bristlecone pine. That'll be me. I'm also on the TikTok machine as at the plant prof. And I hope you'll follow along and watch all the nonsense there. If you'd like to support the show, uh, there'll be a link in the show notes for buy me a coffee. So this is a new thing I'm trying. Whether you want to give $5 or $1 or subscribe to a monthly donation thing, you can do it there. It's less strings attached for both of us than Patreon was, and I think it's a little bit easier. But what I want to talk about the most in today's mid-roll is NAPOD POMO, which is just so much fun to say. National Podcast Post Month. My podcast network, the Podfix Network, is participating. And every day in November, we will be dropping a short episode on our Podfix Presents feed from all the different shows in the network about different phrases and idioms that you hear in your everyday life. So stay tuned in just a second to hear a trailer for NAPOD POMO on the Podfix Network. Y'all are the best. I hope you're having a good day. And you're going to hear some words from Salve Chagrin in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Hello, I am Salve Chagrin, podcast maven and president of the Podfix Network. And I am here to let a cat out of the bag. This November, the Podfix Network will be participating in something I think you will get a kick out of. It's called Napod Pomo, or National Podcast Post Month. Every day of the month, we will be busy as bees, as we bring you the Podfix phrase of the day. Each member of the Podfix network will introduce you to a simple phrase or idiom by filling in the blanks on its origin, and even teach some old dogs new tricks by helping you use them in your day-to-day lives. Now, in order to really make a mountain out of this molehill, and ensure this isn't just for the birds, the Podfix network will be giving away a prize pack each week for someone who can show they used any of the phrases in their real lives. Text to a loved one. Letter to a co-worker. Zoom call meeting even grocery store chit chat. Just play it by ear and drop it out of the blue. Then email us at podfixnetwork at gmail.com. At the end of the month, five winners will be drawn at random to win. Piece of cake right? And that cake even has icing. Wait. That's not right. But you know what I mean. You will make new friends by introducing them to a new saying, and more importantly introducing them to the network. The world then will truly be your oyster. Finally, before it slips my mind, and to ensure you don't miss the boat, I want to put a bug in your ear. Subscribe to Podfix Presents today wherever you listen to podcasts, so none of the Napod Pomo episodes fall on deaf ears. That's Podfix Presents, the official podcast of the Podfix Network. Artist owned and loved. So, so I want to talk a little bit, um, two things, and and it's it's fun when I have guests that like write their own segues. It's great. Okay. Uh, you, you were talking about. Uh, your, your uh, new college that you work at and your new mm-hmm. role and all of that. Tell us, like, tell us what you're doing today. Like, what is okay. what is your job on whatever today's the November? Uh, no, what? It's not November. Good Lord. Uh, September 21st. Thank you. I am not ready for that yet. I'm Me not neither. I'm not far from it. Uh, so I am an assistant professor of ag communications here at Abraham Baldwin. Uh, we have a very, um, a, a fairly new program in terms of ag communications. I think our degree has only been at the school for maybe four years at this point, and it's moved between, I believe this is our third department at this point, uh, finally landing kind of where AgCom usually belongs. AgCom typically um, you'll find paired with ag education and sometimes ag leadership uh, okay. at, at most schools. And I, listen, I was a student the first time that was done when I was at Oklahoma State, and I didn't think it was cool or fair or appropriate. And now I so treasure it because I see how much we have in common and shared amongst us. Uh, really, I'd, if I could do one thing, I'd probably change all of our departments to say ag service, because that's what we have in common. The ag teachers, the ag communicators, those in leadership who want to go work in policy or you know work as extension agents and so on. Uh, we're all people who want to be of service to this industry and to the good that it does in the world. Um, so so my job, I uh, 
we are a fully undergraduate uh, institution. We have no graduate students, and I have oh, okay. uh, I have a great number. I've got about eighteen students I advise. We've got about thirty five or so right now. It's been we've been adding throughout the semester, so I think we're we're approaching forty. Uh, in our major and hoping to grow that a couple of times over in the next few years. Yeah. So um, wonderful, wonderful little school. But I spend my days uh, teaching, advising, uh, doing research with my students, uh, which is uh, really my research activities here are focused on how can we engage them? Uh, this is a very hands-on kind of school. Mm -hmm. And so my challenge is, is to occasionally you do have to stand at the front of a room and lecture as much as you don't want to. <laughs> but I try to limit that and get them to engage and talk and do activities as much as I can. And uh, and they they sure respond well to it. So that's the majority of my job right now is just teaching and then being a dad. That's it. Those are pretty good jobs. Those are big jobs. I, like them. I do. Uh, I like them. And they're not. They're in some ways not different. Um, and so I, I actually am a little bit jealous of you talking about like your class sizes. And uh, yeah. well, like we're your... hoping to bring those up. But yeah, they're um, right now. My biggest class has uh, twenty three in it goodness and, okay uh, my smallest class has three um that's that is normally smaller than we would allow to happen here in most schools you know you don't make it a certain point sure but because we are so new and growing they're allowing us to keep these going uh that one in particular is a capstone class so it's kind of a final senior project for that group uh we're really really um that was the thing that sold me here when i came to this institution uh to do the interview the academic interview the students were all over it uh they were there to give me tours they showed up and uh, peppered me with questions. No one else in my seminar got to ask questions because they had so many. Uh, and then they were shown back up for another section of, of questions and answers. They were hyper engaged and very focused. Uh, this is a thing. I, look, I'm a, I'm a proud Gen Xer. This group <laughs> of this age right now, these college students are whatever generation this is at this point. Uh, they really seem to get that they're kind of in control of, of their own value and making sure they get value for what they're after. Uh, more so than I think my generation did. You know, we were good at being snarky and and sarcasm and all those kind of things and feeling jilted. Uh, they're really good at at taking control of their world. And so, not all, of course, but I, I think a proportionally a really impressive number of students in this generation. Uh, they got me excited. That's really cool. And and that so you were telling me before we uh, hit record. Uh, about your capstone project. Oh, yeah. uh, can you yeah. talk about that a little bit? Well, so as a kind of a capstone, most ad com programs, uh, I think probably most commonly do a magazine where students will go out and sell advertisement. At capstone, you always try to bring all of our skill sets together, right? So wherever right. we can get photography, we can get uh, audio broadcasting uh, together, print writing and so on. Uh, we've got three in the class this semester and uh, we can't really pull off a magazine at this point. I'm hoping to go to the point we can. I know the dean would love that. But I, I also, I don't really like to be where everyone else is. Uh, if everyone else is doing a magazine, I want to do something different. And so what we came up with, uh, collectively working with those students, trying to decide what they wanted to do, we're going to do a, a podcast ourselves. A uh, uh, Six episodes, they're each producing two episodes of it, kind of a Radio Lab style technique of cool. interviews with discussion back in the studio, kind of explaining things, but looking at people um, who don't fit uh, a, a more traditional role in agriculture. Maybe the person themselves is not what you expect in a more traditional role or a person who's in a non-traditional agriculture role that is absolutely a part of ag today. And mm. so how do we then, uh, hoping to broaden that view of what ag is and who does it uh, to that exact point. And so they've, they're going out right now, they're collecting interviews and we'll be doing stories and then they'll be actually planning out a whole social media campaign uh, we're going to have that plan by the end of the semester and then start advertising it over the holidays and hopefully start uh, plan to start launching the episodes um, in mid January is the current plan. And, you know, see what we can do, see if we can draw some attention. Um, that is having very to do cool. the work of the, of the industry. So that's yeah. very cool. You hear that radio lab, uh, Austin's class is coming for you. Absolutely um, right. <laughs> so, no, yeah. Yeah, Judd's no, really scared of me right now. I, I think you. so. It's quaking. <laughs> uh, no, I think that is so cool, and I would love to help however I can, whether absolutely. promoting it or or whatever I can do. Absolutely. Uh, oh, if don't, don't volunteer. I will absolutely sign you up. You'll be in charge. Oh, no, I would love to help. Good. I'd love good. to help. And and as we get closer, if y'all have a trailer, I'll put it on the show, whatever. Awesome. Like, That'd be great. Thank you. Sure. No, that's that's so cool, and I think that – uh, again, you're you're trying to train the next generation of uh, communicators and and uh, not necessarily just podcasters, but it does teach important skills and 
uh, all of that. Right. Well, I mean, the key here is it is podcasting, yes, but they're also there when they go out and interview those who are interviewing in person. We are doing a few stories that are, I mean, they'd have to fly somewhere to do the story. So they're doing oh, wow. those like we're doing today. Uh, but where they can do them in person, we're doing photography along with those. They're going to be writing blog posts to promote each episode, uh, doing a whole social media campaign. They've all been food suite certified this semester as part of the class. It's the part of that. And I guess that's really the challenge I'd say for the ag communicator. We don't specialize a ton. So when in my field, in, in, in extension, we did typically specialize a bit. So if you were a graphic designer or uh, an editor, maybe that's what you did. In most ag comm shops, there's one or two communicators. And so you do it all and you need to be able to go out. And when you get an interview, think to uh, ask good questions, record good video, take good pictures, get good clean audio, uh, plan for event promotion. Think about what you're doing on social media. Uh, we are well-rounded communicators uh, by nature, um, sort of the, the, the master of all and jack of all trades at the same time. Yeah. Uh, to be a top level ad communicator, you have to be able to juggle like that. And so I love getting them to put it all together. Wow, maybe one of them can come teach me what I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> come help me fix my marketing strategy. No, that's that's so cool. That's so cool. I really love that. I think that, um, you know, we, so much of, uh, okay, I think the important part of college, uh, the important part of the education that we receive is not the knowledge itself. I mean, that is important. Don't get me wrong. Mm -hmm. Like that's That's important. But the experiential side of that and the, uh, life skill side of that is something we neglect yeah. um, from time to time, uh, and not not just in our field, but as a as a, an academy as a whole. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we want to yes have really smart, really well educated humans coming out, but we really want humans that are well rounded and able to really contribute to the society around them, to the the world around them. You know, I, I think to to kind of follow on that. The point is not teaching someone how to do the thing. That, that's a key part of where we start. The idea of how to make a podcast, how to go take a good photo in, in my world is pretty straightforward. At the end of the day, though, if everything in the world went as it was supposed to all the time, I wouldn't need to put you through college. I just give you a white sheet with a step by step and you go out in the world and do that. It's making sure that you understand how to how to react when things go wrong. That's yeah. what I want my students to be at. So. Yeah, we teach you how to do the thing. Fine. Now then, let's go do some of it and let it screw up and let it go crazy so that you know how to hook up when things get exciting and different. Um, I'll, I'll point back. One of my favorite stories I did as an ad communicator, um, when I was working for Extension, we went down the other side of Houston to a, a small town where they were training posse horses, actually training posse and horses. Uh, St Texas still uses a lot of posse, uh, folks who were just enlisted to come in and do crowd control on horseback huh. and stuff. And to help these horses in particular, they would do things with fireworks and sparklers and having them do obstacle courses and mark, you know, walk through an arena with all kinds of noise and lights and flashes going on. Uh, I remember watching a horse on the last day of this thing, and they were just taking a sparkler and going all around, uh, you know, all around that, that horse's head. And the horses just chill. <laughs> and their point to this being, when we're trying to do crowd control of the horse, one, no one argues with the back of a horse. So you just turn your horse around <laughs> back foot. They just don't argue, right? But you also don't want the horse getting scared and somebody getting accidentally hurt. So it's they're teaching the horse how to how to hook up and behave when things get out of control. And that, to me, is a perfect metaphor for what we should be doing in college. Like, yeah, we want you to know how to do the task we've taught you, but we need you to understand that every something will go wrong every time you go out there. Some little thing. How do you respond to it? How do you not sweat? How do you not panic? Um, that to me was kind of uh, towards the end of my career when I realized, okay, I'm kind of done here, uh, when things would go wrong and it just was not a big deal. Uh, huh. there was no excitement to it. I, like we were doing a thing at the state capital of Oklahoma and I nearly took out the, the knees of the governor as she walked behind me. Uh, we stood <laughs> at the wrong time and it was like, okay. And at that point, and actually that particular event, um, I had sat down, I was playing some videos with the, there were award recipients. The, the families of these people are in the room. In fact, there's one family the the man had died and the children hadn't talked to each other in like 15 years. And they're back in a room for the first time in 10 or 15 years, not talking to each other off the room. But I mean, there's pressure, right? There's, there's some drama. Uh, and then I, I find out the last minute that, yeah, you have to play these, but also you can't actually see your screen in order to do that and not have my premiere screen up all the time. I had to have a piece of black in there. 
So I was playing my computer blind without being able to see what I was doing. And the governor comes and sits next to me. And I'm like, okay, here we go. And 10 years earlier, I would have had a full on panic attack stroke. Mm -hmm. There's just too much going on there. I was confident everything worked other than nearly taking out the governor's knees. That's just sure. bad timing. Yeah, sure. um, but yeah, getting them to the point where they can just be calm in a storm. That's what I'm, I'm aiming at with these students. That's awesome. No one argues with the back of a horse. No one that is my, I, I need a t-shirt, <laughs> man. That's although I don't know. I've watched cable news. I think there's a lot of people that spend a lot of time arguing with the backs of horses. Um, <laughs> no comment. No, I'm going to get myself in trouble with that. And I don't even care. Uh, <laughs> oh man. No, that's so important. I think, uh, uh, Courage under fire, so to speak, right. in, in any field is so important. We, you know, when I was onboarding with Extension, we did a thing where we would have journalism students come in and we'd have like five minutes to like, we get a prompt, right? A whatever. Mm -hmm. This is your whatever. Here's your scenario. And, yeah. yeah. And then you'd have like five minutes to prepare a press conference and these journalism, these like 19 year olds with like fire questions at you. Absolutely. And the number of adults, grown up adults, like, middle-aged men who would completely lose their composure in a room mm -hmm. full of kids. I mean, they're not yeah. kids, but you know what I mean? Uh, and I'm just like, Oh my goodness, are you, what's going on? So this, this, there is some importance of, um, yeah, ha having that, that ability to be composed in, in hard times. Well, and flip that around and look at what they do with the Bob Wright brigade and the buckskin brigade there in Texas, where they're training young kids as early as 12 or 13, who are interested in hunting and, and those type of sports, how to answer questions, how to deal with that pressure. I would go in and we do the same thing. We put a camera and a bright light in their face and ask them questions. And with a little bit of training, those kids, they didn't blink. Uh, they really learned how to, how to just do it well. It, it's an important skill. It, it really is. I always say there's, there's two things that will get you promoted uh, beyond. It's, it's not the smartest guy in the room or the smartest girl in the room who tends to be the team leader. It's, first of all, the one who will talk. So when the mm -hmm. boss wants somebody to give a presentation, who's willing to get up and talk? That's why you need to understand public speaking, even if you don't like to do it. It's so that you're not always the, the second fiddle and when you're the smartest one on the team. The, right. the other part of that is when things go wrong, do people in leadership see you as that calm force, that person who can be counted on uh, not to lose their, their stuff and, and to take care of things? I think that's important as well. For sure. Well, and that you kind of you kind of jumped my next question. Or my last question, uh, <laughs> where because I'm I'm looking at the time and it's it's 50 minutes and oh, I was yeah. like wow that, that, <laughs> might, that went fast. Uh, we haven't even talked sitcoms much. So uh, what what's your favorite sitcom? Oh, that's a hard one. Now there's too many good ones. Brooklyn Nine Nine just went off and I'm a little sad about that still. That was funny. But I, I do think if we just look at the last, if we got to take out all the greats, take away Cheers, Mash. I mean, Mash is probably it of all time, all shows. But uh, The Good Place, I think, was yes, I mean, just yes. brilliant television. You stick through the first season, get to the last episode, you and I say you'll finish the rest in a weekend because it's just so brilliant. Oh, um, it's so brilliant. That, that very last episode was – it was a master class in yeah. – yes. I, yes. Watch The Good Place. If you even watch The Good Place, that's it. It's, that's it's it. well worth your time. <laughs> so uh, a question I always ask as we wrap up all my guests, and you've given okay. us a lot uh, already, but – if you had to send something home with our listeners, like a piece of advice mm. about communication, about, I don't care, whatever. It could be about, yeah. you know, the age at which you will eat gas station sushi. I don't care. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the tenure of gas station sushi. Um, what would your piece of advice be? What, what mm. would you like our listeners to remember? Well, one, don't eat the gas station sushi. <laughs> at any tenure. Get the gizzards. <laughs> get the gizzards. They're better at gas stations than anywhere else. Um, that's an extension trick right there. You know, yeah, you it is. all the best places. I do miss extension. I do miss all that work because we traveled and we met people and we saw extension agents always in their County take you to the best hole in the wall place that doesn't even look like a restaurant. And it's all wonderful. <laughs> uh, my, my best, my best thing. I think that's the place where most of us screw up. I think when communication truly goes wrong, it's because we're thinking about ourselves. We think what is our best argument? What is our best? What do we care about? And it, always begins and it should end with audience if you take the time to think of your audience to understand their needs their wants their what motivates them their level of understanding of things um when you go wrong is when you stop thinking about them spend time figuring out how to communicate always think of i think i've, I've got a i've got an eight-year-old daughter just turned eight 
She is a spitfire and she's a ton of fun. But I can talk to I'm blue in the face with the logic that makes sense to me. Doesn't make a dang bit of difference with her. I have to get into her lane and talk to her about things in ways that she that matter to her for her to really listen. And sometimes then it still doesn't work. But I know if I'm talking about the things that matter to me, if that's my perspective, um, it's not going to matter. So she has a bad habit. She tends to suck on a couple of her fingers and we keep trying to explain to her, it's going to ruin your teeth and you're going to have to wear braces. And she doesn't really care. I mean, that's like mouth jewelry to her. She's fine. <laughs> so we, we still haven't found the right way to get to her. We haven't found her perspective on this one. Uh, but I know that telling her what matters to us and I don't want to pay for your braces isn't working. And I think that's just a, a simple way of stating that you've always got to be focused on audience because they're, at the end of the day, if the audience doesn't want to listen to you, if they don't care, if they don't think you care about them, there's absolutely nothing. I mean, you can be the best communicator on earth. They choose not to listen. You've failed. So you've got to be in their lane and, and be of service to them. Communication is a service. And if you treat it that way, I think you'll be better off. That's fantastic advice. Man, uh, gosh, you know, 50 minutes went fast and I have <laughs> so, so many other things I'd like to talk to you about. So maybe we'll have to do this again sometime. Sure. Anytime, anytime. Uh, any, anything else? Did we leave anything out? Was there something that you really wanted to get across? Uh, you know, um, I think if there's one bit of advice. Okay, so what do ag communicators always get asked? Because there is one question. I'm sure you're familiar oh, yeah. with this in the plant world that you get your own set of questions. For us, it's what camera do I buy? Ah, uh, okay. Especially if I'm a camera doctor, photographer, a videographer, what camera do I buy? They're all good. Every camera you can find. The best camera is probably the cell phone that you have in your pocket. But if not, <laughs> you want a different camera, better lenses, more control, get them. You can't buy a bad camera now. What you can do is buy a camera and not read the, the manual and not figure out how to use your camera. You've got, if you spend the time learning your camera, you'll be happy. Um, that's it. That's probably the, the best ag comm advice I can give you. Stop asking me what camera, just buy the one you can afford. And then and, learn and how to use it. You know what? Read the label, just like with the herbicide. Read the instructions. Right. They yes. tell you right on there what to do. So just do the thing. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. That little booklet that comes with the camera, they, they tell you exactly how to use it. Most people just throw it right in the trash. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. No, I, I put it in. I, so what I do is I stick it in the box, and I tell myself that I'll <laughs> need the box. And then I stick the box in a closet, and now I've got a dang closet full of full freaking of boxes. boxes. Yeah, I actually, I mean, I'm just as bad. I actually go when I when I buy a camera, I go find a PDF online of the manual, download it to my phone, but I still keep the manual. I've got a, a folder <laughs> in, my, in my file drawer that's like you know eight inches thick and trying to fall off the hinges, full of manuals <laughs> that I don't need because they're all in my phone. So, You're a purist. It's I'm all right. a purist. I just you can't throw the paper away, man. Yeah. You might need that box in case you ever were willing to return the camera. You would never be willing to return. Yeah, sure. no, not, yeah. not in a million it's years. Not that's so. funny, man. That's awesome. So, Austin, where all can we find you? Do you want to be found? Sure. I'd love to be found. Um, let's see. So, uh, Twitter is a really great place to connect with me. Uh, Aussie Moto there, A U Z E M O T O. As I go to check that to be sure that that's actually my handle because I haven't looked at it in a while. That sounds um, right. But I believe that is correct. Um, and I just searched for Twitter at Twitter because that's Twitter at Twitter.com. Sure <laughs> Uh, yeah, so Aussie Moto on Twitter. Uh, you can find me uh, as well on LinkedIn. And uh, really, all, any of the channels can be found from LinkedIn. Uh, I would also point anybody, if they want to learn more about ABAC, to, um, and it's simply that, abac.edu, abac.edu. And they can learn more about this beautiful school in South Georgia. So Very come cool. visit us. So here's, here's one at last interesting tidbit. Sure. This is going to be episode, like, maybe 80? I don't know. We're up there. I've done like 60 interviews. You are the first person who has said the words LinkedIn to me. Oh, really? Uh, in two <laughs> years. And does, uh, yeah, no, that's funny. Yeah. Well, it's, because it's weird, right? It's nobody, we all have it. We don't typically use it too much, but. Right. Um, I actually have really enjoyed it this year, though. Uh, as I approached finishing my PhD, um, uh, an old friend of mine, Billy Chambers, who was uh, our advisor as a state 4-H officer back in the day, um, has long retired, but someone who just talking with her at the time was fascinating. She was such a good friend and such a good friend to us. She reached out to me there. And so I've been reconnecting with a few people that I just hadn't had the Facebook and, and those sort of things. Um, it, it's, it's got opportunity. I just, it's interesting to figure out how to use it. In truth, I'm on all over TikTok. I don't post much yet. I'm trying to figure out how to 
make constructive, useful, interesting TikToks as a professor of ag communications and uh, uh, without <laughs> trying to dance because I cannot. Uh, that's mm. just, uh, I just can't. But my, my, my general uh, outlook has just been post nonsense constantly and maybe some of it will stick. Your content is brilliant. I, I, if, if people, if listeners haven't been following you on TikTok, they need to. It's, it's well worth being there. Well, thank you. Uh, Austin, man, that was so much fun. I really oh, yeah, enjoyed absolutely. that. Thank you. It's, thank you for having me. Y'all, I hope you'll take the opportunity to expand your worldview, even if just a little and in a small way. And try your best to figure out how you can see the world through someone else's lens just a little bit more. Thanks so much for Austin taking the time to record with me and just being full of so much good information. Most of all, thank you so much for listening and being a part of this. I appreciate your time, your input, everything else. Thanks to the Texas Tech Department of Plant and Soil Science for all the support and for letting me do this wonderful, crazy show that I do. We've got a lot of content this month. We'll be back next week, in fact, with an episode that was supposed to come out in October that you're going to love about the encyclopedia, about editing the encyclopedia. I don't know how these people agree to talk to me, but Melissa is such a cool person and you're going to love it. So y'all keep being kind, keep being good, keep being very cool plant people, and I'll talk to you next week.